Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. In just a couple hours, I'm finally going to go see Black Mass. I'm very excited. Mm. Also, here is John Schnapp. Hey, what's up? Everyone who <laughs> came down to the Long Beach Comic Convention, it was great seeing everyone. Had a great time, so thanks again. Also here, Roth Cornette. Yay, Roth's Hello. here. Yay, Roth. Oh, wow, what a warm welcome. Thank you. Oh, my God. Um, way to start my Monday. It's so good yeah. to be here with you guys. It's Thank you. It's good to have you back. Well, it is Monday, which means it's time for our weekly box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. It was an extremely close race for the number one spot at the box office this weekend, but the new film, The Perfect Guy, captured the top spot by just $1 million, taking in a reported $26.7 million. Coming in second place is the new M. Night Shyamalan thriller, The Visit, bringing in $25.7 million. In the number three position is the faith-based film, War Room, making an additional $7.4 million. In fourth place is the Robert Redford Nick Nolte film A Walk in the Woods making 4.6 million and rounding out the top five is the Tom Cruise film Mission Impossible Rogue Nation adding an additional 4.1 million to bring its worldwide total up to 613 million dollars. John what stands out to you in this week's top five? I well first of all I, I got to mention on our on Friday show we of course did our box office predictions and I was one million dollars mm-hmm. off from having a perfect Just five for five. Just one million dollars? Perfect five. I picked. I picked the visit would actually come in number one, just ahead of the perfect mm. guy. Uh, but perfect guy got in front of it, so my number three, four, and five spots were all right. So by one million dollars, I was off. But um, so great, great outing for the perfect guy. The visit. Bloomhouse also has to be very happy with the visit. Five million dollar budget, ladies and gentlemen. Five in an era where nobody seems to know how to make a movie for under one hundred eighty million dollars. $5 million movie made 26, almost $26 million on its opening weekend. Bravo for them. But the big thing that stands out to me, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation in the top five for the seventh week. Seventh right. week. Now, I think it's safe to say that run is about to come to an end. We've got Scorch Trials. We've got Black Mass. We've got Everest and yeah. not a wide, wide release. So that's going to end that. But great run for Mission Impossible. Couldn't have happened to a nicer movie. Uh, very happy for it. So, Schnepp, what stood out to you about the box office report? Uh, just all the old people. We got the visit <laughs> about some gra- crazy grandma and grandpa. Like, you know, like, you can't come outside at 930 because we get weird after that. And pour juice on ourselves. And I don't know what the movie's about yet. I, I do want to see the visit. I don't know if you guys saw it, but I'm excited to see this kind of thing. First that's person. exactly what it's about. Yeah, I, exact same yeah. Way. <laughs> I saw I saw a picture of like the old lady pouring something. I was like, what do they pour like cream of wheat on? Like, <laughs> the clam chowder up, woo, or whatever. This soup is so good. <laughs> I hope the children aren't watching. Oh, they are. It's a super pervo, weird. It's not pervert. I just like to watch them with the clam chowder. <laughs> but uh and then, and then grumpy than old juice. man three a walk in the woods <laughs> finally came out the old man jokey comedy with amazing actors but i heard the movie's like because eh, eh, it, yeah. it's just kind of it, it was it misses the mark i heard it's corny but i love those actors so i don't know all the critics were saying yeah but you know i still kind of half want to see it but that's a yeah old people ruled the box office yeah, yeah. i will definitely go see dennis um your wonderful production manager and mm. i both have a thing about like old people rocking on movies oh, that, nice. you know like the best exotic marigold hotels sure, in the but world those, were really good. Good. those are good yeah. movies it's just nice to see i there's something about it that i really like um so, but what struck out, it, it's funny because a couple of things, I thought there was, was a significant box office in a couple of ways. One, the return of, is it a Shyamalanaissance? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> he's he's had a couple of, um, you know, he did Way More Pines on TV. Right, that was um, fun. Yeah, but, it, but this is like a big hit for him, really, considering the cost of the production and the fact that it was a success, both with critics and you know, as compared to his audiences previous and audiences really yeah. as well. Too. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's sort of a really big deal, right? Yeah. Like, I think. Yeah. And then again, Tom Cruise, people, I think, were at the point that they were like, 
does this guy have it anymore? You know, although Edge of Tomorrow built over time, great movie. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but Mission Impossible, certainly, man, people love this franchise, and it's an unusual franchise for people to love these days in a way because it has absolutely nothing to do with superheroes. Right, right. yeah. And, right. and you know, I remember about maybe 10 months ago when the word first came out about the visit and M. Night was going to go work with Jason Blumhouse. And I remember thinking at the time, this is probably exactly what a dude like like uh, the sham hammer needs because yeah. when he, look he was no fluke sixth sense was no fluke he proved that by putting out a few other excellent movies unbreakable but as mm-hmm. the power went to his head he started believing his own press what was it time magazine did the cover article on him that kind of the next spielberg it said and he, he deified himself in his he movies really right. did he deified yeah. himself in his movies and there's that infamous story we talked about before where he had dinner with that executive from disney who had problems with the script and their shooting plans for lady in the water and mm-hmm. he was like i am m night Shamhammer. you shall not question me and he's left disney and did and went on to make one of the worst films in hollywood history with lady in the water but i remember when this came out about 10 months ago thinking this could be exactly what he needs get back under somebody like like a Jason Blumhouse who is just killing it right, right now with his production company, give him a, a minimum budget and say you don't have all the power in the world here, and I think that really lets his creativity shine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I hope I am like I we joke around about the Sham Hammer all the time, but deep down I am cheering for the guy. Same I'm here. He's because, a nice guy. Yeah. He's I mean, I don't know really if you guys nice guy. have interviewed him, but he's. He's so pleasant, you know, and certainly fans were unhappy with The Last Airbender, rightfully so. Um, But you're right, you know, like, I love Unbreakable. You know, if he wanted to return to that. I even love signs before the last 10 minutes. No, I, I, even, the last 10, I love you know, signs. You swing the bat, all that kind of weird <laughs> stuff with the water. Like, this, this cup of water will destroy the aliens. Like, aside from that. So they're invading a planet yes. 70% like, covered with yeah. water. 75% <laughs> covered with water. But you know what's even weirder? Like, I like, I even like signs when it's like the newspaper and it's like folds and it's M. Night. Yeah. Like, he's like, and he's the one who tells him, go to the water. It's like, yeah. there's something about that that I, I, got, I still get a kick out of. So, yeah, it's like 50, like half his movie. Movies I love, half yeah. movies I, I hate. So it's like that's a that's a pretty good ratio. When you're, you're not talking about some people, it's just, just that all know. the movies we've hated of his have all come in a row, yeah. which is which has kind of been the problem. Right. But you're right, Unbreakable, <laughs> Signs, the, the the happening. That's the one for me that I started to go. Mm. No, no, no. That, no. That's I'm the saying one where people run no, no, away for no. I'm, I'm thinking the villain. Like, sorry, I'm, I'm the saying, happening was horrible. I'm sorry. saying <laughs> of the movies that came in a row that we did oh, yeah, not like. Right. The happening. Well, the, the happening all time. Uh, air the trees are angry. Time, the trees. Yeah. yeah. The wind. People so are good though. Mark Wahlberg argues with a ficus. Like if you yeah. haven't seen this in the same way that you watch the room, which is drunk and whatever else that's you do, perfect drink responsibly. It's amazing. Do you remember that scene where they walk into that cabin? It's like him and I, who's it was a Zoe de Chanel who was with them. I can't yeah. remember. And like, and there's some plants in the house. He's like, We're not here to cause any harm. Yes. <laughs> like, he argue, yes. He's like, he's like at a certain point, he's like, Hey Ficus, I don't want any trouble here. And it's like a plastic <laughs> plant, and he's like, Oh, it's plastic. But I remember it was it was sometime, I can't remember it was this might have even been before the uh, the last airbender, or might have been just after. But that movie Devil was coming out that yeah, he was yeah. just right. producing. He didn't direct right. it, he was producing it, and I remember remember this was the total change of tide when it came to M night with with the audience it was like i was in a theater that trailer played devil and then near the end of the trailer from producer M night Shyamalan and the whole theater laughed yeah, yeah. they laughed it's like that's that's, that's it then. when they started taking his name off of some of the films i think it was like earth what was the, uh, the with one? the Will Smith Return movie? To Earth, uh, Earth, Return after Earth. Eight. after it was after Earth. Earth. Yeah. Yeah. after Earth. That's and the they started taking yeah, they started yeah. being like Will Smith and this other guy that you used to know, right. you know, yeah, directed I mean, it. But you know what? I hope this is the beginning of a resurgence for him yeah. because, like I said, he's no, one film is a fluke. Three or four really good ones is no fluke. He's got talent. I really hope we get to see some more good too. stuff from him. And I gotta say, I, the Shyamalan, the Shyamalan um, Shyamalan but I also <laughs> love Tom Cruise, and I like I, I really do. And I I loved him in I mean whatever is like personal, I have no idea, but. Um, I loved this Mission Impossible movie. I'm excited oh, that Jack it's doing Reacher. as well. Jack Reacher. I, I love loved Jack Edge of Tomorrow. Edge you of know? Tomorrow. So good. So good. But yeah. also notable in the last five weekends is that the top movies, I think it's for five weekends in a row that the number one movie has been African-American led. That's also, I that's think, awesome. a, a notable thing that's that's gone on in the box office. I think true. so. Well, yeah. well, it, went, it went from 
um, the NWA biopic, mm-hmm. right. Sheila Compton, and then War Room War took Room. over for this. So NWA was two weeks in a row. Then War Room took over for one week, and so maybe it's four. Maybe weeks. it's it's four or five. I'll have to yeah. look that up. But no, you're right. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember that ever happening before. Yeah. Good observation. All right, what's next? As many of you know, the upcoming Marvel film Guardians of the Galaxy Two is set for release on May fifth, two thousand and seventeen, and work is now underway. According to director James Gunn, pre-production is now underway in Atlanta, where Gunn is now living for the next ten months through the pre-production and shooting of the film. The original Guardians of the Galaxy made over seven hundred and seventy-four million at the worldwide box office, and the original cast are all expected to return. Roth, your thoughts on Guardians of the Galaxy Two beginning pre-production? Like I, I have no ability to be rational about this at all. It's ridiculous. Like I don't go see movies more than once or twice, typically speaking, because you have to like go see so many movies and whatever you, it's hard to do. I've seen this five times. I saw Guardians five times in the theater. I think half of that money came from me. I love this so irrationally, but so wholeheartedly. It hits me at every, like the little girl in me is delighted by this movie a hundred percent i love rocket i love groot i love star lord i have a rocket i'm not gonna say where it is in my house um (laughs) but i have a little rocket um i want a baby groot but i also think it's exciting in the sense that you could i know we're only going to talk about this briefly but you could actually as a fan talk about this for a really long time because there's like huge implications in terms of how the cosmic sort of players are going to enter in with mm-hmm. Mer- earth's mightiest you know and like how is that going to connect n- together and who's star lord's dad and like there's just so much room for speculation that it's it's really fun to talk about this franchise and it's so beautifully executed by James Gunn. I'm going to stop now. Um, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm super pumped about this. Guardians of the Galaxy was such a surprise. Number one, it was a total surprise when they just announced the damn thing. So it's like they're making Guardians of the Galaxy. That's odd. Right. That's a strange choice. Yeah. And they were saying, oh, this is going to be the first big bomb. They shouldn't have done it. And it turned out to be such a huge pleasant surprise. Makes over $700 million. Everybody talks about what a huge box office smash it is. Yeah, and then The Amazing Spider-Man 2 makes over $700 million. And everybody calls it a huge flop. But anyway, um, I love this movie. And I believe I heard Gunn say something recently that really caught my interest about Guardians 2, which was this. That because there's been some speculation, like could Tony Stark show up mm-hmm. in Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah, Hulk, whatever. James Gunn said this: uh, Peter Quill's going to be the only Earthling in Guardians of the Galaxy too, which I thought that was a very interesting yeah. thing because that shoots down a lot of the speculation I had, and I think probably a lot of the speculation you guys had. So that's interesting. I believe they get the actors in front of the camera sometime in early 2016. Mm-hmm. So in the next few months, they'll probably shoot the film for about three or four months. They're building giant sets right now. It's exciting. It's actually happening. I should yeah. have your reaction to this. Oh, it's very excited. I, I love this film so much as well. And uh, it's exciting to see that Marvel's doing another cosmic film. Mm-hmm. So not only Thanos, but I look forward to seeing weirdo characters like yeah. Moon Dragon. I want to see more of the Celestials. I want to see the Kree. The, all those characters like that they just kind of touched on. I'd love for just to see a little bit more. I'm not saying they're going to introduce Nova. They've already introduced the Nova Corps. So... It's kind of it's ripe with all the possibilities. We know Gunn is a super nerd, so he like it's in the right hands with this guy. I of course predicted it would make over a hundred million in the opening weekend. It was completely right. So whatever, <laughs> guys. Um, but yeah, I'm a super fan of this uh, of this property. So I can't wait. The only thing that sucks is we have to wait two years. I want to see more of the right. Celestials for sure. We're yeah. I, I will really will stop, but I could talk about the Guardians for your whole show. To make you feel better, Sadly. we are closer to a year and a half. <laughs> Other oh, than two years. Right so we're on. getting close to a year and a no, half. No, that is. That's right. All right, folks. We reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the tailor are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? It has been confirmed that a third installment of the Jeepers Creepers horror franchise is coming to the big screen. Writer-director Victor Salva is returning to the franchise for the third time, and in a recent interview had this to say about the new film. Writing and directing a new Jeepers film, the first in over a decade, is incredibly exciting for me and I believe for Jeepers fans all over the world that have been asking for more. What will go before cameras as Jeepers Creepers 3 is a new and terrifying chapter from the Jeepers universe. We are 
bringing back the Creeper's truck and we'll be addressing the big question about the Creeper, what it is, where it came from, and why it does what it does. John, buy or sell the upcoming Jeeper Cre- Jeepers Creepers 3. I am very, very torn for several different reasons about whether to buy or sell, and I'm probably going to have to air it out and then decide at the end if I'm going to buy it or sell it. On the one hand, I love Jeepers Creepers, the first one. Mm-hmm. I think that is a f- tragically underappreciated film. It is creepy and weird. And I felt like I remember when I went to go see that, it was the first film in a long time. There are horror movies I enjoy, but not a lot of horror movies actually creep me out or make oh, me feel yeah. scared. Jeepers Creepers made me feel freaked out. Yes. I loved it. Uh, it was it was my real big introduction to Justin Long. We had seen him a little bit in uh, Galaxy Quest right. before that. I thought, this kid's a star. I was really happy. I, I honestly thought he'd be a much bigger star than he is right now. I think he deserves to be a bigger star than he is right now. But anyway, um, not so big on Jeepers Creepers 2. Whatever. They've taken over 10 years off from it, going back to it. So on one hand, I'd be very, very excited for it. On the other hand, there are the comments that the director just made saying we're going to reveal who the creeper is, where he comes from, why he does what he does. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Part of what made the first Jeepers Creepers so amazing was the fact that we did know. It's just, it's the mystery of it. The things that we don't see or the things that we don't understand are the things that scare us far more than the things we do see or that we do understand. I kind of want to keep that mystery about the creeper a little bit. I understand you got to progress the story, so who knows, maybe they've got a great idea for it. But the other thing, and I have a feeling this is going to dominate most of our conversation here. The other thing that makes it difficult um, to really get excited about a Jeepers Creepers film being directed by Victor Salva, is that who pronounces his last name? Yeah. Salva? Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is the fact that what I was blissfully ignorant of for a lot of years, until just like today, was that Victor is a convicted child molester. Uh, that happened 30 years ago. Yeah, I, th- I think 30 years ago, uh, he was tried, he was convicted, he served time in prison, blah, blah, blah. And that opens up a big hornet's nest and a big bundle of issues that I think we struggle with a lot when, we co- when it comes to artists. And do we separate the, the individual from the art? Can we not? Do the lines get blurred? Um, so before I express my thoughts on it, Schnepp, like... First of all, Jeepers Creepers in and of itself. And then the, the director, and how does that affect your anticipation of, of the next film? Sure. When I, I saw Jeepers Creepers and Jeepers Creepers 2 within like a year of it, of, the, of each other, like I think I saw Jeepers Creepers 2 in the theater and I saw the Jeepers Creepers like on home video or whatever when it came out. And I thought, like, you're right, Jeepers Creepers is a, a really creepy film, the way they introduce this character, why, they, why the director mentions, oh, we're bringing the truck back because that truck is a very, you know, it's a it's a it's, a, it's its own character in the both of those films the creeper himself it's a, like it reminds me of a cicada like it disappears and it comes back i'm sure there's some kind of uh you know something really creepy as far as its origin you're right i don't really need to, to know like where did it come from what is its origin or anything like that you know if they delve more into it i think they kind of delved into it in the second film a little bit more where you saw the creepers kind of weird human skin tapestry and you know spoilers he kills people it's a horror movie so <laughs> and he's a monster so it's kind of i mean the pros of that film were definitely it was a it was a comeback for the creature feature it was a monster movie it had amazing special effects a lot of gore the the creature itself was very a very cool original design for a biped creature with wings it the first movie had that horrifying ending oh i mean awesome one of the most ending. terrifying yes. endings ever and uh, the second film, you're right, it, it didn't, it was not as good as the first film, but I appreciate it for what it was. It was like, we're stuck in a, you know, it's a, it's not we're stuck in the, in the uh, cabin in the woods, we're stuck in a school bus. Yeah. So it had some other cool elements to it. And of course, uh, my favorite guy from Twin Peaks, uh, Ray, uh, Ray, uh, Ray Wise was in it. Is he your favorite from Twin Peaks? He's one of my favorites, yeah. Oh, yeah. I absolutely love I him. I mean, it's so. great, but there's a whole, anyway. I, everyone Peaks. from Twin Peaks is my favorite, yeah. <laughs> but he's just slightly, uh, like, okay. leads everyone for me. But uh, that's a whole other conversation. So, yeah, Jeepers Creepers, it's a really cool horror film. The sequel was good. Um, 
what you know what tarnishes it is uh, honestly like Victor Salva's past and it's one of those things that we were talking about with Roman Polanski when do you when what if can you let a filmmaker be a filmmaker outside of making films especially if they've already paid the price for doing what they did that was illegal now something with like pedophilia which is one of the most horrible crimes that can be committed um this man is responsible for videotaping himself kind of forcing himself on video on a child actor who was 12 years old. And so he molested this boy on video and was was caught and paid the price, went to prison. Now did that boy who's gonna pay the price for the rest of his life, is that fair to this guy gets to keep making films and hiring other younger kids like in Powder, he's the guy who made Powder, very hypersexualized shower scenes with a hairless boy. I mean, you start to read into these things because of what the guy did in his past crimes. Is it okay to judge this person because of his past crimes? I think it is. I think it's like, look, this guy actually did this. It's on video. He's went to jail for it. Did he pay for that crime? Yes, but then he's moving forward with his visual directorial style, which is still fetishizing young boys. So in a certain sense, I mean, I don't want to condemn anyone, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm reticent to be 100% into Jeepers Creepers 2 or anything that this guy does because pedophilia is one of those disgusting and horrible crimes that the guy was 29 when he did it. He's already a grown man. Mm -hmm. So he's a sicko. Sorry, you know, yeah. Roth? I mean, I, I think that you're right. Okay, so there's the movie, just the movie, which is when it comes to cult films like that, getting another shot, whether I'm particularly attached to them or not, is almost irrelevant in my mind because I know that there is a fan base that is. And so I sort of think it's a good thing because there are things that I am very attached to that I would love to see move forward, like Sarah Connor Chronicles, that never will, but it would make me happy. So if it did, it should happen. You know what I mean? So like, and that side, yeah, like cult films, I, I think it's great when fans get to revisit things that they love. However... I think you're right. It's a very complicated question. You can't, you cannot um, highlight enough how serious of a crime it is. You know, like the boy has come out winters, now a man, it's been 30 years and talked about this, you know, and he got 15 months in jail. Um, Victor Salva. Victor Salva got 15 months in jail for filming himself, ha performing an oral sex act on a 12 year old and molesting this boy on camera. Now, my questions would be, okay, he got 15 months in jail. Is that an appropriate sentence? Well, that's the sentence he got. I don't think it is an appropriate sentence, but that's the sentence he got and he served it. What kind of reforms took place is what I would ask. Is that even more, in some cases, even more than the punishment? Although, again, like he ruined this boy's life probably in many ways. Um, he certainly impacted it negatively. Um, what sort of reform took place? You know, how was he? Because pedophilia is one of those things that is very difficult to correct. Um, and mostly pe pedophiliacs do not change. Child molesters don't change. But does that mean that they are to be damned forever? That's not our system. And I... <sighs> I can't say right now whether it's what should happen, but should I think that what we can say definitively is that he shouldn't be allowed around underage men, young men unsupervised ever. That those restrictions that apply to anybody else who's been a child molester need to apply to him. Whether we as an audience want to engage with him, that's an individual choice each of us is going to make with our dollars. Um, and I wouldn't say that I know what's best for anybody else to decide. Um, but it opens up a lot of questions. Like if a movie um, or a TV show makes a move that is culturally insensitive, do we throw out the baby with the bathwater, which seems to be what we do a lot of times in our culture, which can be like sort of a shaming culture. So those are two different questions. One's a pedophiliac, one's like, that wasn't a smart thing to do, TV show. So they're two different questions, but they ride along the same lines, which is where does it start and where does it end with our decisions? And that's up to us individually. I think probably I would not go see the movie um, personally. You know, I would feel uncomfortable with it in the same way that I feel discomfort supporting certain organizations that do things that I think are harmful, you know, but that's me. Yeah, it's it it is it is a tricky, tricky question. I don't know if there's a definitive yes or a definitive no, a definitively right or a definitively wrong answer. Look, I, I have been very 
you know, vocal about, you know, let's take a situation like Roman Polanski. Mm -hmm. We talked about this before. The dude drugged and raped a 13 year old girl. And then when it became apparent that he was going to be convicted for it, he ran, he fled the country and he's been, you know, living overseas ever since continuing on with his work. He was never held accountable and never punished for what he did, nor did he ever accept the punishment for what he did. You know, I get very upset about stuff like um, Chris Brown, a famous, you know, famous celebrity who so severely beat a woman that she had to be hospitalized. And then the pictures of her face came out that just horrified all of us. Generally speaking, that dude was never held accountable. Right. I, I mean, generally speaking. And that really annoys me. You hear now about this guy, and there's a few, there's a few weird things that has to go into your thinking process. Okay, um, 30 years ago, I don't care if it was 30 years ago. I don't care if it was three days ago. Time, to me, makes no difference. But he was charged. He was convicted. I believe he got a sentence of three years, released after 18 months or however right. however long it was. That's that's what our court. That's what our society did. That's what our courts gave him was that much time that he had you know nothing to do with that. So whatever. So the question then becomes: Do we? First of all, there's the bigger question: Can we separate the individual from the art? Right. Um, and then there's the qu the other question of: Do we, if we tried him as a society, if we convicted him as as a society, we gave him a sentence as a society, and then he, as a perpetrator, paid that sentence and did the time that we ascribe to him as a society? Are at what point do we say, okay, we we said what your debt was and you paid it? At what point do we go, okay, then move on, you know, go and, and do no more harm, do, more, do no more wrong. As far as I know, the dude has never been factually convicted or charged or with any other thing since. That's, I mean, there's, there's speculation, there's some secondhand stuff, uh, and which could be true, which could be not. All I can go on is what is verifiably factually proved. So I, I honestly, I don't know how I feel about it. On one hand, I feel like, hey, he did, he did the crime, he served the time. At some point in society, we have to say we are going to allow you to move on. At the other hand, I'm revolted by the whole notion. Like, other than murder, like, being a pedophile or a rapist, sexual crimes, is just, it's, it's, it's almost too much for my own mind to process, right. you know? Like, how, how do you, how do you un look at a guy, know that he did something like that, and try to feel, you know objective about it. All right, let's move on to the next topic. All right, as many of you know, director Steven Spielberg is currently gearing up to shoot his film Ready Player One based on the popular novel of the same name. According to a report in The Hollywood Reporter, actress Olivia Cook has landed the role of Artemis. Cook has appeared in such films as Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, The Quiet Ones, and Ouija. Set in the near future, Ready Player One follows outcast teenager Wade Watts, who escapes from his bleak surroundings by logging into the Oasis, a globally networked virtual utopia where users can lead idyllic alternate lives. When the eccentric billionaire who created the Oasis dies, he offers up his vast fortune as a prize in an elaborate treasure hunt. Along with gamers from around the world, Wade joins the adventure and quickly finds himself pitted against powerful corporate foes and other ruthless competitors who will do anything in the Oasis or the real world to reach the treasure first. Schnett, buy or sell the edition of Olivia Cook and Ready Player One. I'm going to buy it simply because I'm really excited about what Spielberg is going to do with this movie. I mean, he, you know, look, he's casting everybody. I think he's like, oh, she's going to be perfect for this role. So I'm, pro I'm probably going to buy anything that has anything to do with this movie until this movie's out. So I'm very excited about the casting of this uh, young lady. I haven't seen that uh, the movie that she's in, but I'm going to buy pretty much anything Spielberg does with this film because I'm excited about it. I, I buy this actually wholeheartedly. I've met Olivia Cook. She was actually in studio with us uh, for a while. I, I thought she was great in The Quiet Ones. Mm. I didn't see Ouija. In full disclosure, oh, I... Hold up. I, I did see Ouija. Oh, that's, that's a you... horrible movie. <laughs> what a piece of junk. I don't remember her in it because it was so bad. I remember laughing and joking through the movie because it sucked so bad. Sorry, Ouija. Yeah, so I didn't see Ouija. Luigi. But I liked Nintendo her. version. It's a possessed Luigi. Sorry. But I liked her very much in, in The Quiet Ones. I thought right. she was really good in that. She's a very quiet girl, actually. She's mm -hmm. very subdued, laid back, very quiet girl. But I like her very much. And after listening to a whole bunch of, because my wife has been listening to Ready Player One on their audio, we can hear a lot of it. I could totally see her in this. So the fact that Spielberg's at the helm, this I think this is great news for, for me, it's a buy. 
I love her. Um, I watched her on Bates Motel, which oh, we, right, yeah. my boss and I both loved her and we really enjoyed the show. But the funniest thing was like, she's obviously the stunningly beautiful girl, but they would just put this oxygen the oxygen mask or like just the, oh, sure. and, and it was suddenly like, Oh, she's hideous. No boys <laughs> like her. And you're like, yeah, like she's, <laughs> she's doing okay. Um, I liked, I really enjoyed her and me Earl and the dying girl, yeah, she um, was which great came out of Sundance. And um, yeah, I just love her. So I buy it a hundred percent wholeheartedly. And I'm also really excited about this movie though, as discussed earlier, when are we going to see that last Starfighter reboot? Right. Yeah, we were she's talking about that off screen. Oh. He's like, well, one more last Starfighter. Okay. What's next? The next Marvel Universe film, Captain America's Civil War, is set to hit theaters on May 6th. And one of the lingering questions many fans has is if Captain America will die at the end, opening the door for Bucky Barnes, a.k.a. the Winter Soldier, to become the new Captain America. In a recent interview with We Got This Covered, actor Sebastian Stan was asked if he would like to be the new Captain America, to which he said the following... No, I really wouldn't. Let me tell you, I think about that every day. It's so not up to me. And to be honest, I really enjoy my job over there. I'm really happy going to work and doing what I do. I love the character that I have. John Byrasel Stan's comments. Uh, I buy them. Um, we we have had Sebastian Stan in in studio before. He's great, and I really love him as Winter Soldier. But it's funny because on this past weekend's mailbag episode, somebody asked the question about could we see Chris Evans moving out and maybe Sebastian Stan taking over the role? And I said I don't think so because. Chris Evans is signed on. He's already confirmed he's going to be filming Infinity War Part 1 and Infinity War Part 2. That's going to be like filming nine months back to back. So he's already confirmed. Plus, we've talked to the Russo brothers who were also in studio with us Mm -hmm. at one time. And while they never came out and told us anything, the impression I think both of us got from them was that Chris Evans' Captain America is not dying anytime soon. Um, So... Now, this does bring up the question, though. Okay, well, if it's it's not going to be Bucky... Could it still be Falcon? Could Falcon become the new Captain America? Recently in the comic books, they have a storyline going where Falcon becomes the new Captain America. So, I mean, there, that question is still out there. I still don't think, I do not think they're killing Captain Rogers anytime soon. I think he's going to be Captain America for a very long time. Um, not only to the end of Infinity Wars, but as we covered on the show a few days ago, Chris Evans made the comment the other day, I'm going to keep coming back and playing Captain America as long as they'll have me. So I, I don't really think there's a lot of question there. They have options in case Chris Everett decides he doesn't want to be it anymore. But I don't think there are any plans right now to make a change. I don't know, Schnepp, you've heard all this stuff. How does this comment we hear from Sebastian Stan affect your view on all this? The only thing that he said that made me like, hmm, was he said, I think about this every day. So I was like, why is this so much on his conscience? Like, <laughs> is he thinking about what am I going to do as Cap? Are people going to hate me? So that's the only thing. But like, as a reader of the Cap comics... Chris Evans is not going to become the U.S. agent. That's not happening. He's not going to become nomad like, I'm sick of this costume. See it in the trash can. Bucky Barnes, now it's my turn. That's not going to happen in the movies. We're talking about comic books are like extended soap operas. They like stretch this stuff out. Steve Rogers could die. He's off doing something. He's gone for a year. He comes back. Remember, Superman died. All these characters died. Human Torch died. They kill everybody and they come back. Nobody dies in comic books. Just like in movies, if it's successful, they'll figure out a way to bring him back or they'll just recast an actor. That's just how it works. But with this, I think, you know, no, I don't think uh, Anthony Mackie is going to become Captain America. He's awesome as, as, Falcon. as the Falcon. It's so great. It's so great to see Captain America and the Falcon. I would I kind of the only thing that I'm bummed about with Civil War is it's got so many other characters mm-hmm. in it. We're not going to get that kind of flavor, but I'm sure those guys will be put on, you know, they'll have the most of the flavor, hopefully. We'll see. But I don't think uh I don't think Barnes is going to become Captain America. Roth, how do you uh, see all this? I it's funny because I, I think it's so hard to read tone in print, but I had read that quote on a site that said that saw the video and said he was saying it sarcastically. Mm. Um like I think about it every day. You Got know it. what I mean? Mm. Saying like I don't think about this because it's not mine to think about, sure. it's up to Marvel. And I think Sebastian Stan does like to keep things close. I love him, by the way, as Bucky. Mm-hmm. Um and I love Falcon. So I wouldn't be opposed to either of those things necessarily, although Cap is my my hero. Um, <laughs> but I, I would say this. I do think he's going to die. Um, I think he's going to die in which you're right. Civil War is basically Avengers 3 before Avengers 3. Right. Um, but it's going to be awesome. And I do think he's going to die. And then I think he's going to come back in either Ragnarok. Um, I mean, think about what's happening here. We're bringing in the character of death. Right. You know, we are bringing in an apocalyptic event. Mm-hmm. Anything is possible. 
Day is night. Night is day. Death is <laughs> cats life. And cats and right. dogs playing together, getting along. That's right. Yeah, and that's what I think. It's I. Th- I do. I genuinely think he's gonna die. Really? Yeah, I think he's wow. gonna die, and okay. then I think he's gonna come back. So it's gonna be a super bummer ending, and then like at least two post credit scenes with like Ant Man cracking jokes or the Hulk on another. Yeah, planet, well, I don't think I think they'll happen. do a po- all the, I think they'll do a more somber post credit scene with like from the cosmos or like I'm still coming at you. I still want them gems. Right. You well, know? Vision has the life stone. Like, or whatever yeah, he does. You know? like yeah, they're gonna, they're, you know the gems are all gonna to come together. By the way, so are the how, holograms coming too? I don't know. How <laughs> how is anybody losing with the Vision on their side? That's what I want an answer to, people. Right. Like how the how is Tony losing? He's got not that he's really going to lose. I have no idea. Um, nobody's winning, really. Um, but like, like you've got vision. That's like if you had Hulk. Like, oh, guess I win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I, yeah. I, that's gonna be interesting. Like, to have a vision. See how they carry all that. It's, yeah, it would be interesting if they did k- kill Captain America in Civil War. It does make it very interesting about how was Chris allowed to already say, oh, yeah, I'm shooting Infinity Wars Part 1 and Part 2 back to back. So if you see me die in Civil War, right. don't, don't worry, even worry about it. I'm about coming back it. as Nomad. I'm going to have this weird blue outfit. Because they, they can always do something like, yeah, we faked you out, right? He's not coming back, but maybe, is he? And they just like tease out the mystery. Sure. Plus, the average moviegoer isn't paying the obsessive attention that the three of us are right. to the tech. But I mean, here this brings up another big issue, though. If they, because why I do not believe at all that he's going to die. It is certainly possible. What One of the big problems I would have with that, though, is something we have addressed on the show before. One of the, Marvel has done a magnificent job with their cinematic universe. Mm-hmm. You know this, that, that I love them. But one of the things that annoys me to no end is their killing, not killing their characters. They have killed everybody, and none of them has stayed dead. Right. They're like... Like, Loki's dead. No, he's not. Thor's dead. No, he's not. Um, Nick Fury's dead. No, he's not. Loki's dead again. No, he's not again. Right. Um, everybody. They, they kill everybody, and none of them have stayed dead, and it totally removes any dramatic tension. Coulson's even alive. Yeah, yeah. Coulson. They drove a yeah. scepter through his <laughs> he's heart. He's supposed to be dead. And but in the he's TV still, world, still, alive. still alive. Nobody ever dies, yeah. and that's the thing now that when there's a death scene, I don't feel any of the emotional yeah, impact. Zero. Because Quicksilver's well, still alive. Yeah, no, probably. Quicksil- I no, guarantee I don't think he, you he's coming I back. think he's dead. He I really be dead. think he's dead. I Loki, from what I understand, was supposed to be dead. Um, but that they did testing and people were like, Did you just kill Loki? Because that's crazy. And they're like, Nope, we didn't. No, I mean <laughs> you know? he's back. I mean, and I, I absolutely believe we're gonna see Quicksilver back at some point because they just don't know how to kill a character and keep him dead. And if they did it, look, if they did it with Captain America. If they did it with Chris Evans, keep them dead. At least Move Star Wars. On. Star Wars knows how to kill somebody. They just come back as a weird, creepy ghost. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey, I am never going to be dead. dead. Be in your mind and floating she, around as a hologram. Freak is dead. Who? Their mom. Oh, I know, she's but she dead. wasn't a Jedi. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm talking about in in Thor. Oh, oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, Frida, the yeah, the okay. His mom. They killed a fourth level character. <laughs> All right, <laughs> unless she shows up again in the yeah, Ragnarok. she's gonna show up again. Renee Russo. Infinity well, Land. they're gods. Yeah. How badass was Renee Russo? So in that yeah, she shouldn't have died. So good. Yeah. I wish that's Odin the one died. Kept her yeah, alive. Odin should have died. Well, where she is? I think alive. Odin's like rotting in some kind of cell. Right, because Loki, yeah, took, Loki over. took over. Yeah, yeah, because I don't believe we're getting in way too much. I don't believe Loki, who is obsessed with his father. I don't think he kills his. No, no, I don't think so either. Bring forth the man gog. That's all. <laughs> I say I want to see the man gog. All right, folks, listen, we've reached that part of the show now for mailbag. If you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Ashley, what is in the mailbag today? TJ Harden writes, hey, Collider, big fan of your show. I never miss it. Been wondering something for a while now. With all the big things that have been going on with Star Wars, like the new episodes, Rebels, and the anthology films, I was thinking, why hasn't Paramount done something similar with Star Trek and their universe? on the large and or small screens. With the 50th anniversary coming next year, do you see them ever considering doing anything like th- what Disney is doing with Star Wars? Thanks, guys, and keep up the great work. Okay, so dangerous ground here. Dangerous, mm-hmm. dangerous, dangerous ground. Mm-hmm. Um, you thought talking about religious and political movies was tough and, and, and fireworks? Okay, this is, this is tough. Um, okay, first of all, Everybody knows that I live and die Star Wars, so keep that in mind. But wholeheartedly, I love just about everything Star Trek. I've watched, you know, the only thing I haven't watched ex- exhaustively is the last Star Trek TV series they had, 
the one with the original Enterprise. Scott Bakula? The Scott Bakula one. What was that one called? The one that had, in like, for some unknown reason, had that Rod Stewart song as their theme song. Right. Instead of like a Star Trek song, they had the, it's been a long, long I know, right? It's like an 80s theme song from a car commercial like, or something. Why is this the theme song for a Star Trek show? Um, anyway, I didn't watch that. I watched a bunch of the episodes. I didn't watch that ex uh, exhaustively, but I watched everything else. Huge fan of Next Generation. Huge fan of the original series. All that kind of stuff. And I'm even a big fan of the Are two JJ Abrams. Enterprise. Yeah, Enterprise. Sorry. That was yeah. the name of it. Thank yeah. you. Yes, it was the it was purely named Enterprise. And I am even. I know there's some people out there who don't. I love the JJ Abrams Star Trek movies. Love them. Um, that being said, why won't Paramount do the same sort of thing that they're doing Star Wars? Because Star Trek ain't Star Wars, kids. Star Trek is nowhere near the size of, of what Star Wars is. Star Wars is one of those few properties that can go out and have, you know, anthology films with a TV series going on, with novel worlds and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Star Trek could do it, just nobody would watch it or read it. I mean, in comparison wise, like right. the numbers. Um, so look, I'm looking forward to them doing another Star Trek TV series at some point. I look forward to Star Trek Three very much. I cannot wait to see that movie. Very interesting. Interesting. Now that JJ isn't directing it, can't wait to see what direction they're going with it. All that kind of stuff. But I know there's this perception that there's big Star Wars and Star Trek rivalry. Like in sports, folks, it can only be a rivalry if they're somewhat close in level, and they're not. Star Wars is an iconic, multi-generational behemoth. Star Trek is a significant player in our in our, uh, in our pop culture for the last number of decades. It absolutely is, but they're on different levels. Um, I'm going to get eviscerated for saying that, but but from my perception, that's what the truth is. Anyway, uh, Schnepp, this whole question: Why doesn't Paramount try to launch an expansive, multimedia level approach to a Star Trek universe, much like Star Wars is doing? I think they will. I think they had to wait because I think, I mean, Star Trek came first. Star Trek yes. came in the 60s with those first three seasons with Kirk and Spock and McCoy. And those are the those are the ones that I grew up on because that's when like TV used to just like there was only like three channels, kids. Tribbles is still one of the greatest yeah. single episodes of television it's ever. Got Star Trek, the original series, they've remastered them with new special effects for people who don't want to watch the old special effects, whatever. They're, but all of it's cool. Um but it's that was the original granddaddy of the science fiction TV shows, and that without Star Trek, you would never have gotten Star Wars. I'm convinced of that. So I don't disagree. Uh, and um, so you know, Gene Roddenberry was like one of those guys who was like pushing boundaries with those Star Trek TV shows, and and it was much more thought through, and and it was about human beings too. Star Wars is about you know it is about human beings, but it has nothing to do with Earth. It's from a galaxy long, you know. It's you know it's a different universe completely. So. Uh, even when they were doing the Star Trek, they were trying to do a Star Trek TV show. Star Wars came out in 77. That's when they're like, just scrap the TV show. Let's make it a movie. But they are different creatures. They're, they're just the way they're written. Mm -hmm. I mean, Star Trek is about certain things that deal specifically with Earth. Like our cultures and our, our, you know, what we're dealing with, and it's always amplified. So we're put in the future, like race relations, all these mm -hmm. religion. It's all, that's what it's about. Star Wars is pure entertainment. And they were able to make a galaxy filled with all these good guys and bad guys. But as a kid, that's that film that was like incredible action-packed serialized adventure. Space opera. Yeah, it's a space opera. But Star Wars, that's what put it on the map and changed the whole game. Star Trek was already around. And they were just taking that already done kind of formula and applying it to a movie. They did the same thing with Star Trek Wrath of Khan. Better added those action scenes that fans of, you know, what was then, hey, you have a space over, how come, you know, the Enterprise isn't fighting anybody, mm -hmm. you know? So you can't just have them talking to the V'ger, you know, with the bald woman, like, no, I understand it. You know, Star Trek, the motion <laughs> picture is a bit of an endurance test, especially if you're not a Star Trek fan. Even if you're a Star Trek fan, there's problems with that. It's very, like, long shots of people staring at outer space, purple, blue sky clouds for 40 minutes you know there's there's things with star trek which picture like it would have been amazing if it was 90 minutes you know what i'm saying so anyway they're different creatures i agree but it's about time i mean paramount had to take a break i think they squeezed every little bit of juice out of star trek before even the trekkies were like we're a little bit bored there was no there were they didn't have that no one was really paying attention to them anymore so it kind of just petered out i remember when they canceled it no one cared so it took someone like jj abrams to reboot it put it in another franchise i know all the trekkies hate that but for myself who is already a trekkie and loves star wars i love all science fiction i don't you know really differentiate it that much 
I thought Star Trek the reboot was really fun. It was like the weird pocket universe. You still had Spock. I'm from the original, the actual Leonard Nimoy. I'm from the original universe, you know? So you had your cake, you could eat it too. Here's this weird dimension. Star Trek Darkness comes out. Every Trekkie is hating on it. I also liked it yeah, like you. You and I just it was, loved it. It though. was entertainment. <laughs> I, and I liked the scene where Spock is like, come on. I, I like that they flipped it. F you if you're all angry about it. So what? <laughs> Big deal. I can't believe they're they're quoting things from a movie. So, so what is my answer to that? It was entertaining. So a lot of people who didn't see Star Trek 2, Wrath of Khan, the original one, we're like, whoa, that was weird, the way Spock... And hey, look, I'll give it a little hate on Star Trek uh, Darkness. What's up with the Tribble blood or whatever that, that, you know, like Kirk comes back at the very end? Yeah, that was... There's some that weak was, that parts. Was kind of, Come that was on, weird. there's some real that junky weird. parts. But overall, really entertaining film. Star Trek Beyond, it's going to have a lot of car chases. I don't know what's going to... I'm looking forward to it. Look, Simon Pegg, one of the biggest nerds on the planet wrote it he's in it come on it's like he loves star trek as almost as much as he loves star wars you know it's gonna have a lot of great scenes in it so i'm i'm looking forward to star trek beyond why are they not i said this like two years ago on movie talk i said why is paramount not doing to get into star trek 3 doing a 10 episode one hour show like we've just started Be our five-year mission right I know we're going to get it. I'll let you talk about rights okay. because I was like, do 10 episodes, then do Star Trek three, then to do 10 episodes. You'd have the best of both worlds. You'd have your five year mission and then you do the big finale. Raw yeah. rights. <laughs> rights. <laughs> there's a, so with the Paramount and OK, so there's so many different things floating through my head right now mm -hmm. after hearing you guys. I love them both, too. I also love all, all sci-fi, and I think they are very different, but I don't think they're different for that reason. I think I liken Star Trek to, like, BSG, where it's the kind of sci-fi that is exactly like it's... it's Battlestar Galactica for you who don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Battlestar Galactica. Come on, silence. Um, it's the kind of sci-fi that that is exactly that's its purpose in a way, is to kind of, like, hit on societal issues mm -hmm. in our culture right. and reflect them in, in a way that allows us to like examine them a little more because it's in space. So Heady. like when they did yeah. the occupation in um, Battlestar Galactica 2.5, um, that was during the occupation in Iraq and like they were dealing with it in a way in the story. Um, Star Trek did that exactly with, with race relations with every, you know, I mean, that's really what it did. Um, but, and Star Wars to me, I think is actually, I had this argument with somebody just the other day, is not just pure entertainment, actually. I think it's much deeper than that, um, especially the first three films where like, I think I've seen the, okay, I'm really going to nerd out. So just like judge me, fine. Um, Judging begin. <laughs> fine. I don't care. Um, the Bill Moyers, uh, Joseph Campbell conversation sure. about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. Um probably as many times as I've seen those first three Star Wars films, which is a lot. And I think that's it. I think like Star Wars, especially when it comes to the story of Luke Skywalker, like Harry Potter and the Ramayana. Yeah, that's right. All three are the same in my mind <laughs> is the hero's journey. And it actually taps into something that's so deep with us mm -hmm. in each individual human being that has nothing to do with the exterior circumstances right. of, of whatever your culture happens to be, but it's your, your path as a human being to try and fight your demons and overcome them. Um, I mean, it's more complicated than that. I'm distilling it down, no, but, but it's great. But like that, that's why it resonates mm. so much universally the same way Harry Potter does not for every single person, but in a big way. And that to me is the difference between them. And they're both awesome and they're both important, but one's just far more universal. Right. Inherently. Also, yeah, let me cut in for one second. You also, the biggest difference is what you just mentioned. Star Trek is about a bunch of characters on this five year mission. Right. Star Wars is about the Skywalkers solely. And it's the mythology of this one group of, you know, a family line and how they have to come back yeah. from evil. It, it, it gets know. a little more complicated when you get into the show. And like yeah. it's certainly the expandable universe, but even the show, I mean, you know, um, Clone Wars followed Anakin the mm -hmm. whole time and whatever. Um, th those are the distinctions to me. But the reason that they're not doing a TV show, which I think would be awesome to see another Star Trek show right now, um, is because when Paramount and CBS divorced, the rights issues to do an actual TV show with Star Trek got very complicated and they haven't been able to sort it out. Skydance hasn't been able to sort it <sighs> out. Mm. Well, I, so anyway, bottom line, Star Wars is better. Okay, <laughs> what's next? 
Lorenzo Malezzi writes, my question is regarding Hardcore the movie starring Sholto Copley. I haven't seen any news on Collider about this film and would like to know your thoughts on it. I think it has just been released from the trailers. It looks really interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's not getting a theatrical release in North America. To, to the best of my knowledge, it's not getting a theatrical release. Um, Schnepp hadn't seen the trailer yet. You, I wish sometimes that all you guys could be in our studio, <laughs> because so I left Schnepp in our conference room to watch the trailer, and all throughout the rest of the, all you hear Schnepp was what? No, get what? <laughs> you see this coming from it? Like so, he's watching the trailer. The trailer is kind of psycho. I mean, it, it's crazy. It's a fun trailer. I love Charlotte Copley. It seem and anything very very cool. But I gotta tell you this, honestly, I wouldn't want to see this movie. Um, I think I think the the shtick of it. After about 15 or 20 minutes, because it is, that trailer is high octane, mm. punch you in the face mm -hmm. kind of crazy. It's really fun to watch. But I have a feeling that after about 15 or 20 minutes, I would get really fatigued of it. I don't know that I could watch a full movie of it unless there's a lot more to the movie right. than what they're showing us. But I think the trailer's trying to show us, you're going to get an hour and a half of this. In which case, I'm thinking, I, I, I don't think I want an hour and a half of that. The trailer's super fun, but... I don't see the appeal for a full-length movie, but maybe that's just me. And you're rough. You saw the trailer. You saw it at the same time I did, basically. What are your thoughts? Do you think it's going to get theatrical release? Do you think you could put up with a two-hour movie of it? What's your response? It did, it did Midnight Madness, I think, at TIFF. tiff. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't seen any of the reviews come out of, out of that, and I think we'll be getting some news about whether it will get a release or not. I can't believe this hasn't been done sooner with with sort of right. like video games being what they have. They kind that, of did with Doom. Remember a the one little The Rock bit. was in? Yeah, yeah like a five-minute segment. Yeah. yeah, but like a whole... I, I agree that it's one thing to play as the first person and another thing to watch it. I think it could be really disconcerting, but cool. Like... I think it's so ballsy, you know, and I think it's yeah, like, it's why haven't you ballsy, done this before? Right. And that it's like unapologetic, like, yeah. no, we're not going to do this and then cut out. We're going to do it for the whole damn movie right. that like, I will definitely go see it. Whether other people are as weird as me, I don't know. I also want to say that Schnepp would play the best game of Where's Waldo on the planet if it involved boobs, because John and I watched this thing two or three times and did not see naked people. He watched it once on naked people. He's like, three okay, naked in, people. In frame uh, <laughs> two of minute five. You can see the guy with the two boobs guns in the, in the lower <laughs> left hand side, ladies and gentlemen. Look, I, I, as an editor, I see frames. So I'm watching, I'm like, you know, I don't know. I just, I just catch things. So, I love this trailer. I, they were right. I was freaking out while I was watching it. I was like, oh my God, this is insane. I I cannot wait to see this movie. And I'll look at it like this. Like anybody who's ever played a, an FPS game. You first, person shooter, first person shooter, by the shooter, way, ladies and gentlemen. You have played that game for like three to four hours without a break sometimes. So think about it like if they if these filmmakers were smart, they would do exactly what a game does. They give you your opening scene. Like, it's probably the dude coming out of that cryo chamber or whatever, and the, the, the nurse, like, you've been here. Let me put this weird gun attachment arm thing. You're armed with your weapons for the movie. That's his wife. Oh, is that his wife? Yeah, yeah. she Spoilers, guys, come on. Um, so <laughs> anyway, then you cut into some crazy action. Like, you guys have probably seen that. I think it's a music video that is all first person where it's the, the guy mm -hmm. fighting with the transportation weapon or something. It's all first person. It's so much fun to watch. So I'm like, look, that movie's got to be like narratively, you get a little narrative, then you have all this action, then you have your cut scenes, but it's all first person where you're talking to these people like, well, the reason this happened and there, or that scene with him and the, her in like the weird flying chamber, all of it looks so amazingly cinematic to me personally, like to see it shot in this way. And you're right. While I was watching the trailer, the first 20 seconds, I was like, I can't believe they haven't done a movie like this yet. I could not. I, I honestly, I cannot wait to see this film. It got me so jacked up and excited. Just like, man, this would be like a nonstop adrenaline rush. This would be like a crank three that we've all been waiting yeah, for. That's exactly what done, I was thinking too. Done from first person. So it actually puts you in the pilot seat cinematically. This could be incredible. I'm jealous of all the people at TIFF who got to see this movie. It better get a North American release. I'm coming at you. Someone put this in theaters now. I want to see it. I'm just jacked up even talking about it right now. I cannot wait to see this. The one really cool line I did like in the trailer was the wife talking to him. She goes, you're going to save a lot of lives. But you're going to have to take a few along the way. 
I thought it was a very yeah. cool line. Plus, very it's cool line. so violent. I yeah. love the unabashed violence to it. It was it's, like it's like a video game. It's supposed to be cathartic. It feels like the precursor to like a full Oculus movie. Yes, you know that like you know they have those Oculus experiences mm -hmm. now. I think did they do a full Oculus movie? If did I'd they? be surprised if they didn't, but I can't recall it off. I can't of my recall head. off the top of my head either. Correct if they did, um, but that to me is like that would be insane. Sanity. Right. Almost too much, maybe. Almost a little too much. This one is the first one, so I can't wait. Yeah. When you put it out. All right. Last question of the day. James Vasquez writes, take a lighter gang. I've started noticing that AMC Theaters is dropping AMC Gold Passes for a new AMC Green Pass. My complaint about this is that not only is this pass a dollar more than a Gold Pass, but it will not let you see any movies distributed by the Walt Disney Company. Why would AMC be making a move like this? I have always used AMC Gold tickets as a cheaper way to watch movies, but now it looks like I'm going to pay full price for roughly half of the movies I see in theaters. Thanks for your time and keep up the good work. Yeah, I actually wrote an email this morning to uh, the people I know over at AMC Theaters, and as we've been doing this show, I've actually got a response, and the response is what I was suspecting it was all along. Um, yeah, so AMC has moved away from gold tickets, and they moved to these things called green tickets, and there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes with these things, but green tickets basically are this. It's $9.00 for a ticket and it gets you into any movie that can save some money. However, it doesn't work on prime theaters or IMAX or 3d. You have to pay a surcharge for those. Why is AMC made the move to not include Disney movies at Disney that includes Disney, Marvel, Lucasfilm, Pixar. Why has AMC made the move to not include those? What I suspected and what the email they sent to me confirmed is, is because of this. It's not AMC's decision. That was Disney's decision. Disney made the decision that they didn't want to participate in this uh, discount program uh, that AMC was showing. So while AMC is doing it, Disney will not allow AMC to honor those uh, passes for their movies because Disney wants, and hey, I don't blame them, Disney wants the full ticket price for people going to see their movies as opposed to a discounted price. So it wasn't AMC's decision, it was Disney's decision. That's the best I, uh, that I know. Do you guys know anything more about that other than that? No, <clears throat> it makes sense though. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime, of course, your movie ticket information. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click on the subscribe button. It's free. It keeps you up to date on all the great videos going on over here at Collider. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where do people find you online? You guys can find me <clears throat> on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TD. SLWH. Check out my movie, The Death of Superman Lives What Happened, uh, at www.tdoslwh.com. What a tongue twister. I'll see you guys next week or tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, our very special guest, Miss Roth Cornette, has been here. Roth, where can people find you? Oh, thank you so much for having me. So much fun. I love you guys. <laughs> You're all lovely. Um, okay, you can find me at Twitter at Roth Cornette. I am on HitFix pretty much every day. Going to be starting up a daily show called Fandemonium that's going to be really stupid and fun. And there may be puppets involved. I'm going to get these guys on it, I Yay. hope. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, our lovely host, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And of course, you can find me just on Twitter, on Facebook, simply at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for Collider Video. And until next time, bye-bye.